Steve, we're all giggles already tonight. We've had a good thing. Good guests. We're here. We're hanging out. It's Monday. How are you? Team's undefeated. My God, it's got to be wonderful. Podcast is back. Yeah, look at us. Look at us. Uh, this is the Stuff Summer Says podcast with... Steve. Hi, Steve. Steve, we have to be careful. I, I, I made this joke earlier, but we've got to be careful having this guest on now because pretty soon we're going to put him on the payroll. We don't have that much budget coming in or going Didn't out. We, had a payroll, yeah. <laughs> we don't even really have a budget. We just kind of do this. Uh, but it's our, our now first thir- three-time guest, Mark Wagenrich. Um, kind of checks in mid-season about his performance, what he's doing, um, but also kind of some of the interesting uh, tangential storylines, I think would be the best way to say that, um, related to this season, um, one of which came up today in the, the press conference, which I, well, we got to talk about that a lot more, um, and what his travel plans are and how he's going to accum- acclimate to the West Coast Pacific time zone. So go ahead and listen to Mark and uh, we'll be back after this. Steve, we're gonna have to be careful at this point. We might have to start paying this man to for, like he's he's kind of on the payroll now. <laughs> yeah, but he's is there a payroll? <laughs> it's a huge one. We have a massive budget here, Mark. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm still waiting to see that check, right? <laughs> um, listen, big big time, big time. We're spending big time with uh, Mr. Mark w- Wogenrich. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great, guys. Good. Thanks. All right, let's let's start there. How are you doing at covering Penn State football this year? Ooh, self-assessment. This is the self Oh, wow, self-assessment. That's a tough one. Yeah. I, I not about this. It's it it's a different world, obviously, than you know, the old time newspapery days. I just went through it's interesting. I just went through um like my dashboard, my um the website dashboard about what are like the, the big stories, the biggest traffic stories that I've had. This year. And the top five stories are all basically a file of post-game quotes that I post after every game. It's literally the headline is something like what they said after the game. And I just compile transcripts or transcribe stuff myself, gets from the both from uh, James Franklin and the other head coach, you know, and post it. And people like reading quotes, evidently, because those again, every, those are my top five stories. I I shudder at having a bye week now coming up after you know next week because I won't have that file. So, <laughs> so when you, it, so that's good. So I, I, you know, I feel like on one side, yeah, I know that that's good. That that's a traffic driver for me. But in the, on the other hand, I go, you know, anybody could do that. <laughs> it's fair. You know, it's fair. Go get a cat and maybe perhaps even train a cat. <laughs> Do something like that. So it's a uh, some it's a bit humbling too, in a way. And you have to find you have to find the middle ground, definitely, and and trying you know and knowing what and knowing what stories draw traffic, and then knowing also how you can maybe drive traffic to well, to a story. I, I will say, don't worry. I, I I have read that, but also the stuff that you're actually writing. Okay. Um. So I want your don't want your ego to feel th- that deflated. Um. <laughs> I guess. How do you find that balance and how do you select the right thing to write about, if that makes sense? Yeah. Stand out too in some of that. Yeah, I I could I probably the best example would come from this past weekend. The story about Vengo Wane and his, you know, lining out in the slot, a 350-pound guard, pulling across the formation, leveling a defensive bet lineman making the Beaver Stadium go nuts, his huge celebration. Like, that video goes viral, right? So instead of just saying, post the video, uh, you know, watch this video of Van Gogh on a truck a guy, well, what's the story behind that? And he's, the thing about that is he's such a terrific interview. He's very engaging. He's got, he's um, self-aware. He's got self-confidence, but also perspective. And he's a veteran, so you know he's also an offensive lineman too. So they, they're just usually good interviews to begin with. So you know that he's going to be reflective and tell a good story about that, and he did. So that's one of the things I really wanted to combine. I know that you know there's a viral moment, but what's behind that viral moment? I think another one is you know, what James Franklin said today about he wants to build you know an international airport in State College, basically, <laughs> and. Like I haven't posted anything on that yet because I'm trying to do some reporting, not just about that, but also going back to find examples 
to me, like that statement is indicative of a larger theme with James Franklin in how he's he's done this really for about six or seven years now and comparing Penn State's program regarding finances and facilities and just stuff to other places and saying, go look at what other places have that we don't. He did it, I think, in maybe 2018 or so when he was at a coach's caravan and said that Penn, at the time, then Penn State, I think was, I think he said they were second last in football facility spending in the Big Ten. And then before they played Auburn, he said, when you're down in Auburn, go see if you can visit their athletic dorm. Auburn had built, it's a whole complicated story, you know, but they had built a dorm where athletes can live. And it wasn't new. It was like seven or eight years old. But he said, go visit that and then see what we do here, dropping football players into East Halls or whatever. And then he's done it with NIL. And he's done it then um, this year regarding um, their training table, their, like, their athletics dining facility, saying, I think he said at one point, I don't know if this is true, but this is what he said, that, that uh, Penn State was the only team in the Big Ten that did not have an athletics training table. So there's this. He's got this line. I'm, this is one thing I'm trying to do maybe for this week is build in the airport line about how they got to go to Harrisburg to fly to California because State College Airport can't handle a 757. But how does that fit into his just long standing theme of we don't have as much as other places? That's interesting to me. I I was I I want to stick there for a second, Steve. Sorry. Um, sure, sure. I I I was kind of surprised by that comic because it was funny it it, it, at the time it was funny and it was odd and then i thought about it a little bit more and it almost felt it was very nonpartisan, but it almost borderline felt political in the sense of like now he's stepping into this role of like realizing the community he's bigger in the community than in some ways of a mayor or anybody that gets elected um we've talked about that growth before do you think that is more just James Franklin being a, a head coach in the modern era, or do you think that's James Franklin, the mature coach? I think there's, I think there's elements of both things that too, but you know, both of those things, it's really not new that the idea that state college airports, a small place is not new to him. He's used that in discussing recruiting and talking about how it's a difficult place to fly into and out of for recruits. And then for his coaches, stuff like that. So that's really not new. But this is the first time he's brought it up in the context of the team having to go someplace. But it also does indicate after 11 years that he does seem to have roots, or at least he's established, feels like he's established roots. Why would he care where the State College Airport can traffic 757s? Well, what, what would that matter to him? You know, why would that, why would he care that that's a larger airport is good for the community, wherever it's, you know, you know, of course, it benefits the football team in some ways, but there does seem to be that element of of him, I think, growing more comfortable in the fact that he has standing and that he, you know, he has the program for eleven years now. It's no longer the old Penn State. This is now his Penn State football team. I remember it was really interesting when Bill O'Brien got hired. He put out a statement, you know, Joe Paterno died just, what, a couple of weeks later. And he put out a statement saying, on behalf of Penn State football, we'd like to extend our condolences. And I found that really interesting at the time, because he was a Penn State football coach at that time for a month. And this was Joe, this was Bill O'Brien saying, on behalf of Penn State football, a month into his tenure, and talking about the 46-year head coach who had just passed away. That really struck me. I didn't get that from James really over a long, you know, over at least a few years, but I think over the past maybe five, six, seven, and really since 16, like that 2016 season as the line of demarcation, when it really truly became Penn State football coach by James Franklin, he does seem to be taking a little more ownership of of that in, and everything that goes with it too. And I the, the airport anecdote was just kind of a small um, kind of grace note to that. So as part of the airport airport anecdote and your approach, you said I didn't do anything with it yet. I, I wanted to do some reporting. <laughs> no, no, funny, it, right? It, I know. Right? Right? <laughs> when the answer is people don't, right? Like they just put that out there. So how often do you say, well, wait a second, I could do something with this now, or I could actually do something with it? 
And then what are the pros and cons in terms of traffic for you or what you're trying to get done? Because the reaction sometimes generates more than right. maybe something thoughtful would. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, I thought about just banging that up right away and just posting that right away just to get, you know, just try to get a drive on just some of the immediate, uh, you know, like vapor trail of that being a bit of a viral moment today. And it may, you know, it, it's not something that's necessarily going to last. But if there is something interesting in there, either, you know, either with regard to the airport, that's not my beat, really. So I, I don't want to get too deep into like state college air traffic control requirements and and, you know, what their load management is on the runway or anything like that. That's just kind of too far afield for me. So I started thinking about it in terms more of what it means in the context of, of the way James Franklin, as I said, the way James Franklin has positioned Penn State football as being, as not quite being a have in comparison to the truly haves. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, that's just a small example of that in which he says, and, you know, this is not something that's, you know, fundraising for a football team is something that he has more control over, obviously than whether State College Airport can can handle big planes and how many big planes it can handle. He's like, you know, I, I mean, I read a story that, the you know, that the airport last year got an FAA grant for some renovations. And I was like, okay, he's not going to the FAA. To, he doesn't have that kind of clout yet. Then he can commandeer federal money, you know, for Penn State football. Maybe at some point, I don't know. But, I don't, you know, Joe Paterno he couldn't even do it. Bear Bryant probably wanted him to move the airport closer to State College when he had to fly into Harrisburg 40 years ago or whatever that was. So this isn't all that new. So by, 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 by maybe trying to contextualize it, there's a second draft of that story that you can do that would, that would recapture some of the initial um, idea traffic, but also expands on it that people then refresh the idea and come back to it and say, okay, this is more reflective of this story. I'm sure the Adventure Bureau, the tourist group, is probably happy he brought it up. <laughs> I'm sure they, that's one of the people I reached out to. So <laughs> There you go. There you go. Um, I think the other main interesting thing that's come from the words of James Franklin of late is lack of words or confusing words, in my opinion, maybe, of, related to injuries. Um, it feels like we've – do you feel like we've seen a shift on James Franklin's injury stance? And – what would be maybe your answer to the question he he asked the other day to the media when I think it was Mark Brennan um, kind of brought it up of of you know I I don't understand why you guys have to ask that what's what's maybe your retort to that my response to that and we had this discussion a couple of us he does understand that we have to ask that he knows we have to ask that he just doesn't like that we ask it he's he doesn't want to talk about that so he. It's it's in a way his you know it's his way of trying to at least stop those kinds of questions until he feels like he's comfortable um, answering them. He doesn't want to answer them at all in any way. It was interesting today. I mean, I asked him about Nick Singleton, and you have to try to frame a question in a way that he's going to try to say something. So I asked him, "What do you want to see from Nick Singleton this week that would that would allow you to believe that he can play Saturday. And he answered it. He answered it, I thought, pretty well. He told, he gave a kind of a recap of what happened last week, said he expects Nick Singleton to play. And that really is just a story in and of itself. And uh, Mike Gross of the Lancaster uh, newspapers followed up and asked him about their injury report. They have a huge long list of players on their injury report. The only thing team that I think has been had more uh, this season has been UCLA. And that could be some teams might just they might not put guys on their injury report. I don't you know, that does not mean that Penn State necessarily has more players injured or at least unavailable. I don't know. It's not an injury report. It's technically availability report. So there are, you know, there could be players who are just are not available for other reasons. I don't know. But Penn State, I, I think the number was 16 that was on their availability report as out for uh, the UCLA game. And a lot of them were guys that weren't going to play this year anyway. We don't know their status. Um, there's, you know, there just seemed to be uh, maybe season-ending injuries, longer-term injuries. We don't know their status. They weren't going to play, and they just keep listing them every week, which I understand. But what came out of that, his answer to Mike Gross about the the nature of their 
you know, injuries, and they have had more this year. He's at least has acknowledged that and discussed that. He used the term season ending. He said, we've had more season ending injuries. And honestly, that's the first time I've heard him use those specific words this year because he has reframed injury discussion with the term long term. And I think that goes back to a couple of years ago. I want to say it was Zariah Fisher, but I'm not, it was a defensive lineman who was injured. I think it was Zariah Fisher, but I'm not, I don't have it in front of me. Injured early, and then he used the word long term. And actually, Zariah came back and played very late in the year, like got in a game or something like that, or might have even been the bowl game. And so he has no, he no longer uses the term season ending for what would appear to be for some of these players season ending injuries, but he did use it today. I don't know what changed there. So the other thing I would say is that we ask about these things and, so, and for the most part, he's not going to discuss it until he discusses it. You never really know with him whether he's going to say something about an injured player or an avail, you know, somebody's availability. We, we really truly don't know. He was asked about Nick Singleton at practice last Wednesday that he had nothing to add or nothing to say at right. that point. After the game, he had, he addressed it. He addressed it again today. There are times when he will say player has, you know, a player's hurt has bumps and bruises. We don't know. So if we stop asking, we stop getting some of that information. So that's why, you know, the continuation of asking it, when he says, I, you know, I don't understand why you're wasting the question, that just seems to me that he's, he doesn't want to discuss it at that point. And he's a little, he just gets a little irritated in that moment that he doesn't want, that's not when he wants to discuss it, or maybe it's something new and fresh that he's not ready or willing to discuss at that point. But if we stop asking, then he gets, he doesn't have to say anything. So I'm more, I'm more comfortable. I'm fine with him saying no, but at least I'm not fine with us not asking him these questions, especially when it involves your best player. Oh, I think that was kind of the confusion because Tuesday he Singleton was available to the to you guys, you guys chatted with him and then he wasn't at practice and it's, it is legitimate news that he is not there like where is he and it's i think it's fair to ask i think that was when mark asked the question the way he did i thought that was a good way but then the way franklin followed up on it was it just made it even more confusing do you wish do you as a beat writer do you want college football to go to like the nfl style of wednesday full participation thursday did not practice etc friday and then game ready status i understand that that's probably <clears throat> that's a sports gambling, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that's some of that's tied to sports betting and maybe college football doesn't want to wade completely into that. But I would be, I think it would, it would just uh, open up some transparency on things like that, because then you don't get, you don't get all the other attendant questions that college that come with college football that, that don't come in the NFL. Nobody will ask a Wednesday in the NFL if a player is unavailable, does that mean he's redshirting and going in the portal? Which is exactly the kind of question that I got last Wednesday about Nick Singleton. You know, that was like, that was, he played four games. He could, you know, theoretically, he could have said, I'm redshirting you. And I was asked that. I asked that. Somebody, you know, brought that up. Is he redshirting and going in the portal? I heard he was going in the portal. You know, or, or I heard he's holding out for more NIL money. And when you like into that vacuum in college football, that becomes huge with with instances like that. So I think just a minor bit, just a minor more, you know, or a smaller bit of transparency, just saying to Mark Brennan like last Wednesday, this is a maintenance day for for Nick. That's all. Where, you know, he doesn't have to give out any information. That's not even giving out any information about his status which is some of the stuff they're trying to protect. If he's, if he's not there and you don't see him and you say, this is maintenance day, you know, even that little bit, I think forestalls all these things that college football brings to the table that just aren't part of the NFL. Well, and from a consumer standpoint, from a more fan standpoint, I need you to ask the questions and you asking the questions I compare to the offensive team's game plan in its first script of plays, right? Hey, James, well, why are you running on third and four up on, on off right guard? Well, we're trying to see what they do in that situation with that lineman, right? 
you're doing the same thing. Hey, we're trying to figure out, can we get it? Will this be the day he answers something, right? So you ask that question. It's the same way they test the defense for me. I, I, and, and yes, he, he knows that you're going to do it. I, I always find it entertaining, the whole, I know you know, and you know that I know. So just give a non-answer answer and you're done, as opposed to perpetuating it. Um, so as the season's gone on here, um, what's your overall feeling of Penn State football right now? You've this team and this roster. I like some of the direction they appear to be heading. I like the look of the offense. I think there's a lot there that they're doing. I think they're doing a lot more with the offense and with the pieces they have than say the last year, even though you can compare points and yards and they're fairly consistent with what Mike Yersich's team scored last year. We haven't gotten to the games where they didn't score, right? So we don't know that. We can't make that full comparison. But the gauge to me is just hearing some of these guys. I didn't get this sense last year that they were, that they seem to be enjoying the offense in which they played as much as they're doing now. And maybe they're just more effusive in it. And maybe it's just the sound of them. Is a, I'm maybe interpreting more out of that or inferring more out of that than they really are trying to say. But there just seems to be a more a bit more animation about the kinds of the kinds of plays they're running, even though they're not successful. They still like the idea of being able to run all these different types of plays and kinds of plays and showing a lot of you know doing a lot of different things before the snap. And Drew, Drew to me, Drew Aller really loves doing that kind of stuff. I think he's got this um, a bit of this football nerdery in him that he loves that kind of placement. He loves all that motion and misdirection and things that he has to control pre-snap. I think he, so he just, he, the way he talks about it, it seems that he's he's just having a lot more fun doing that than he was last year getting asked time and time again, why aren't you throwing the ball downfield? He didn't throw the ball downfield much against you show at one time, I think, right? To Liam Clifford, maybe there's another one. I think there might've been another one, but he's not, he's, I don't know. He's doing it more and they're maybe having success more with it, but he's also just, he seems freer, you know, he seems real confident in it. And I get that sense from the offense. I don't know how that's going to extrapolate against USC or against, or at Wisconsin or against Ohio State. But it does seem to me like they are playing more confidently and that that is turning into, at least so far, that they've been able to, to succeed with that. I'm really, I'm more interested to see how they're going to handle defenses or how their defense is going to handle some of these other, you know, these offenses that can throw, and especially like a USC offense that can throw, and Ohio State offense that has the receiving core that they have. Because I found it really, really interesting the way, to me anyway, maybe it was just me who was interested in this, the way they handled Tom Allen early in the year. It was on the sideline, then he was in the coaching box, and then he's not – he doesn't have the microphone anymore to talk with the middle linebacker. That goes to Dan Connor. Um, like that had to be some of that kind of stuff. I think some of that stuff had to be really difficult for him. Maybe he didn't want any part of that. I mean, he's, you know, Tom Allen has mentioned that he didn't want, he, I, you know, that he didn't want to deal with the head coaching stuff anymore. I really got that sense from him that he didn't want to deal with the back office, like the back end of the head coaching stuff. But he also, had to get used to not being able to blow his whistle at practice. And I think that on the field, that's a big thing. So on the field and game day, how that's been working, you know, again, it seems to be smooth er, but I'm, that's something I'm really interested to see how the, when, how they're going to handle, how he's going to handle specifically when they get those really the more um, high powered offenses that can stress his defense in different ways. Do you have a list of stories at this point that they're like, okay, I'm hoping to get to this before the season ends. And, or, and, and how has that, how does that list change for you during the season? Yeah, it, yeah, it does. It always changes. You know, the idea of like this week, um, one of the, like one of the writers who works with me, I, James Franklin brought up their kicker. Um, I don't know how much, and I really don't know. That's one that you're talking about, like traffic and, and, and audience. I don't know how much people are going to want to read about the kicker. But it's really interesting to me that, 
you know, here's a, a walk on kicker from not far away, you know, not far from Penn State and State College. Who is going to be, you know, ostensibly going to be your kicker now for at the Coliseum against Ohio State at Camp Randall? The guy who'd never kicked a field goal before last Saturday or never attempted one in college. And you have a former starting kicker at two schools who transferred in and a starting kicker who's won the job twice in two different camps. And now this player. That to me is that's an interesting story, but will it resonate? I hope so, because kind of stuff like that can be interesting and curious. Um, the other thing is, you know, what makes it, it resonate? Like, is a good story need a headline, or what, what's going to make what what can what yeah. advice would you give to help make it resonate to with someone who's writing it? Yeah, it, it it's who is the kid, and that's a hard thing to do because we haven't been able to talk to him, and James Franklin did talk to him a, a little bit about it. But who is this guy? Who is, you know, in the in the uh, you know in in recent years, James Franklin has brought in scholarship kickers, scholarship specialists. So you know, a lot of times they were walk ons, and you know, but now here comes a walk on. Um, the idea that a walk on is going to now be your starting kicker to me has some resonance too. Or somebody who didn't win the job, but now pretty basically has taken it from two starters, to, from essentially two. Starting guys, I find that really interesting. Headlining, it's just I don't, I don't know, but that to me is is when you get, especially when you know, especially too, if he hits something really important down the stretch. Are, are you traveling this weekend? I am. I'm headed out there. I think I'll be going to a school of communications event. Mm, Planning on doing that. that. Look forward to that. Hopefully that uh, works out. What does uh, what does your travel schedule look like? What what hurdles are you ready to be prepared? <laughs> I go to Harrisburg too. No, I should tell him. Look, some of us have to go to Newark, my man. You know? <laughs> we don't get a bus escort to you know to Harrisburg and back and and fly seven fifty seven out. I'm I'm really stuck on this. I really enjoy this storyline because I haven't done. I haven't done any market research, but the idea of expanding the runway to accommodate lower, what's the market demand? I, that's Wednesday that's college. what I wondered too. Um, like, it, do I not know, do I not know the the state college to London direct would be a huge hit? <laughs> Maybe it would be. I don't know. But why? What's the market demand for seven fifty sevens and triple sevens? They're going to set up. Out? They're going to set up a flight specifically to to Australia for Riley Thompson and that that like <laughs> pipeline. Like well, it's Riley like the Thompson. stadium, right? You're going to have to use it seven times a year, and then you got to find some other days to more make some more revenue out of it, right? So they'll right. have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but my yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I'm heading out there. I'm going out there like uh, Wednesday, actually, a couple days in advance, just to get the uh, just a little. Get acclimated. Sun. Acclimated. Yeah. yeah. Little, acclimated. Uh, ahead of time. Yeah. Look, but look, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. This will be my big one. Um, my big trip this year before ostensibly a playoff. Okay. All right. Well, safe travels, safe travels. Thank uh, you. Um anything else we should know? Anything else the fans should know about the beat right now? Anything going on that you... or anything good you got yeah. coming? So you had that you had like what gem do you got coming we need to read? <laughs> gems related nothing i don't know i'm really i do want to work on this i do want to work on the the airplane thing and i you know or just like the airport thing that just fascinates me maybe that's a nice bi-week story and the other one i'd like to work on i the, the idea of the it, he's mentioned it so many times the impact of a training table um of a dining facility of a team dining facility it's not like they never had one it's just it was go to a dorm right they just I think they went to Pollock Halls yeah, or something the Pollock, like Pollock Dining yeah. Center. And, it was, it was. I, I ate there. It was completely fine. Like it was. That yeah. sustained me. And I know you know nutrition and all that is, is such a, a larger element, but but it, you know why is that such a big deal? Just eating together. I mean, there just seems to be there to me. There seems to be an element of of just schedule control involved in that too, that I'm going to have players in the building from 7 a.m. to, to 10 p.m. basically, that I have 16 hours of their day that they can't even go eat, you know, somewhere off campus. And I know, you know, it was one, you know, one of the things Bill O'Brien used to say, um, that he, you know, some of these guys, he's like some players, 
he brought in the idea of like sleep and nutrition. And he right. said, what are you eating after practice? And he would say, I, you know, I got a Snickers bar. I got a thing. And he, I mean, he coming from, you know, the NFL where they just did all that tracking, even back then he was, I think Bill O'Brien was kind of one of the first people to say, look, at least can we just get a place in here where I can get some protein bars and bananas for these guys, you know, just something, you know, post game. So they started like that, that snack thing. And then expanding, expanding on that. But were they really, was Penn State really the last team in the Big Ten to have a designated athlete training table? And is that is that the worst thing in the world not to have one? I don't know. It's it's yeah. funny. It's weird because like imagine Bill O'Brien going through the either WVU rain delay or the Michigan State <laughs> rain delay. And like, <laughs> yeah, no. It's, yeah. Good point. All right, Wogo. Um, where can people find you, find your stuff? We are at, uh, if you go to SI.com, it's the Penn State on SI site, SI.com slash college slash Penn State. Always a good, you know, keep feeding the beast. Okay. So there's always uh, always new content up there. We'll read it. We'll read it. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank Thanks, you. Darren. Good to see All you, Steve. Yep, Thanks, good guys. To see you. Steve, did the air, airport thing become the biggest storyline of the season so far today? Like, it was very accidental. It was almost a one-off comment, and it feels... Slightly larger, all of a sudden. It, in an unbeaten, unquestionably somewhat boring, not boring, but you know, just kind of workmanlike season. Yeah, like it kind of popped up there. I think that's fair. I think, um, yeah. And I think it'll, it could have some legs. I mean, I think Wogo, I would be interested in seeing a follow-up story. Even, even give me something that, you know, here's the top 20 programs in, in the nearest airport and how long the runways are, right? And, and build off of that kind of simple stuff. And I guess I'm not totally sold on the coach doing this for the community in any way, shape, or form. But he said it. But I mean, I, if if he did, there's a part of me, and I assume some cynics who were tougher than me would say, okay, there's his first act of community service. I mean, it just... Okay, wait, let's it, unpack that for a second. Cause, okay. Because, I mean, he has donated money. Don't get me wrong. He has done... done... But in a lot of ways... Paterno, who was at Penn State, built a library. He he did things funda- foundationally that changed the center region, particularly just also made the football team good enough to make people care about it and raise awareness. Has James Franklin done anything like that? And that's not a criticism. I don't ask that. But the, like- no, and I and I need to be. I can be too offhand and critical about that stuff. So no, I, I think you're right. I think Pater- people would point to Paterno in '73 with the graduation speech, challenging the university to be as good as the football team, ostensibly. Right. Um, well, not ostensibly. That's what happened. Um, I think, and I guess I'm, I, I would stand by this. So it's like I don't think Coach Franklin has done a thing. Yes, there's been money. I don't think. I guess the words that, that activated this little grumpiness for me about this was Mark saying his, you know, some roots in the community. I don't know, right? Like, I, I think that's the words that I struggle with, with are there roots in the community? The move to make the airport bigger is because it would make it more convenient for the team, just like the training table. Yeah, it would benefit the, the community if, you know, there's a demand for it. But heck, I'm not really sure that's the case by some of the stuff that's happened here. So... Yeah, if this is the hill he decides to first step up on and, and take a stand on, sort of, I'm like, hey, it's worth it to us. I bet you it'd be worth it to some other some community leaders. It would build some business. It would be economic development. Okay, that'd be cool. And it, it might be the first really visible thing that way, other than showing up before the start of, like, the 5K at the stadium or something else to say the right things. Right. Right? That's all. Like, and, I, and I know what his job is, and it's not necessarily that. But the DNA of Penn State football through the years has been that it's the coach's job to do that kind of stuff. Well, so. I think that kind of that's kind of what I was getting at there, or, or, or uh, I've been I was kind of pondering, and when that kind of hit me, then I was like, wow, that's kind of almost like a, like I said, almost a political statement uh, in a sense, because it does have a greater impact. Not that he doesn't necessarily care about like the community at State College, but I think to me, what's interesting about it is like. I, I thought it was interesting that Mark said he he's putting in roots because he's been here for 11 years. And, and that's not to say he hasn't put in roots, but like, I think a great example of him putting in roots would be the, the 
the lip service he gave the field and how the field has kind of become this very popular restaurant all because it started about uh, started out with him taking players out to the field to, and that sounds weird to say taking players out to <laughs> to eat at the field um and, and and like i feel like the field has become a very popular restaurant because james franklin takes players there to eat there and have these one meaningful one-on-one conversations um i think that's kind of what what is interesting to me and so i don't know i what i struggle with but I also don't struggle with given his salary and and really the amount of money is like uh, should a head coach head football coach of any program be in that type of power position? Not necessarily like we're, we're getting really rabbit hole here, rabbit hole here. But like, <laughs> should they get like? And that's kind of what I I don't necessarily struggle with it. Like, I just I, I don't know where that line is, and I think this is just a reminder of how important like. Like yes, like it it primarily benefits the football team, but it would could and probably does benefit the center region if there's a bigger airport in State College. Not this is we're now lobbying for a bigger airport in State College is what this podcast has turned into. But that, that, you know what I'm saying? Like it, like you're not going to drive to Pittsburgh now to to take a flight. You're you're going to get on a plane State College to take a flight to go on vacation. Um, so I don't know. Those are my thoughts. I, that's kind of. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, and he might not have put that much thought into it or been tried or whatever, just in it, saying it's a good, and, it would, and he's right, it would be a good thing, it would be whatever. So, you know, the backdrop is, you know, Wogo's going to drive to Newark to go to LA, and the football team's going to get a, you know, escort to go to Harrisburg. And I guess my, you know, and we'll talk about the travel, and one other little piece of context of travel that I just actually thought about. Here's, here's my expectations as, as, as a fan, and probably not as big a fan as you. Hockey team just traveled to Alaska yeah. and won two games, right? Yeah against an unranked team all people are expecting the football team to do is go to california and win a game against an unranked team so you know i think that's a very fair point i think we brought this up with guy when he was on the podcast like are you, are you gonna pass any lessons on I, I i think it's i think that's a reasonable expectation i think that's a reasonable expectation um anything else from logo there that we want to dissect and digest i just i think he's thoughtful about what he does which i which i like right you know, talking about the kicker story, but what's going to make it work for traffic? Going to be a good story, but are people going to read it? And I, that's just, just interesting. It's always been a challenge, but it's even more so now when there's just so much out there about the program and college football and trying to find something to get, that gets oxygen and really starts a fire online. Well, and I think the other thing there is like, and we've talked about this with virtually every beat writer we've had on, is like, they're all eaten from the sh- same shark bait you know it's it's and so how it gets diced up and divided this is always very interesting to me and it's kind of like who runs with it and takes it in and i think that's kind of what we'll go is trying to do there with like being patient as opposed to just posting the the airplane or the airplane the, the the runway story um today so i thought that was interesting uh, i did want to want to clarify one point steve there is a list uh, on my twitter of the longest runways uh it's um, of in around the big ten i it, Okay, there we go. Good. So, see if anybody needs that. That's Save a free some work. And then I also mapped out like there's a map where you would extend the uh, the, the the runway, but but James Franklin has to buy a farm. That's what I've determined. So um, that's how that's the research we're doing. I I have a plane guy. I asked the plane guy about this today because I didn't understand why it this didn't that. work. And so yeah, I saw it. No, and it's been a story. I mean, I remember. In the 80s, right? Paterno talking about the runway isn't big enough for us to do whatever and do the expansions. I think they've got somewhat bigger planes, obviously, through the years. So it's kind of the old Paterno line, what's, what's old is new again, right? Like it just, it, that same story. And then even with Mark talking about Tom Allen making the calls, like I think about the Galen Hall, Jay Paterno, who was the third? There was like this three-headed monster up McCreary. there. Yes, right? Like yeah. somebody was calling running plays, somebody was calling passing plays, and somebody else had to relay the thing. And, you know, I hadn't really thought about that until they talked about, you know, so somebody's got to, Tom's got to relay the information to do it. You know, it just feels in some ways some things never change, even though they change a lot. So, all right. Um, Let's talk about the football game from this past Saturday. Uh, It was weird. It was like, it was objectively, I thought it was going to be weird. And it was just about as weird as I thought it was to see UCLA in Beaver Stadium playing a conference game. And maybe also weird that the game was at, noon which is 9 a.m their time um i feel almost exactly how i did about the illinois game um as i did about the ucla game is in person i was 
squirming a little bit, and then I went back and watched the the tape, so to speak, and I felt like Penn State kicked some butt and then some. Um, they they really, I think, played a very strong defensive game throughout. Um, my biggest thing is like there were some plays that that just can't happen next this upcoming weekend that that concerned me um but i think like all things considered not having their star running back um i think they played very like i said on the blog very much fine and i think that's fine like i think that like nothing too much to grumble about and that's that's a good thing um could be the the people in alabama calling paul paul feinbaum show today right Right, it's a, it's a, it was a great week to be workman like, right? Because yeah. it could you could be win any of three or four other teams that lost the game that they probably shouldn't have. They looked, yeah, they look they look fine, they look good, and you know, take away the late touchdown that makes the scoreboard look a little different. And it was probably even more impressive in some ways. So no, they did everything they've done to this point everything they should have. You know, as about as well as you can. Um, you know, I'm sure there are fans who are like, wow, top five, number four, we'll see. But that's we will we'll find yeah. out. That's kind of about how I feel about it too. Um, did you watch a game on TV on Saturday? Did you, did you listen? I did first little bit on radio because I was traveling, um, and then on TV. So yeah, um, is Gus Johnson trying to endear and win over Penn State fans, like win Penn State fans back to the Fox Army by the simple shout out of the Wi-Fi sucks? Because I think that's what's happening. <laughs> it could be could be he knows he's going to see him at least one more time this season in beaver stadium you know? too yeah right 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 yeah. you know so i i think and, and there is such a vitriol against fox and noon games at least on social media i mean whenever there's a game posted at noon i just kind of go look at the comments and, and and see all the people uh oh, fox sucks oh noon's the worst time for a game so it's it's kind of funny that the guy who's broadcasting the game that that in theory had the potential for the most people to see it that, during the week that involves their team is not where people want to see it or the time they want to see it. So that I, I don't, I don't think they're unaware of that as well. I, I wonder what the self-awareness is of Fox right now. Like I really do wonder if they know that they've, I wouldn't say they've lost the majority, but they've lost a strong number of Penn state fans in terms of we're only turning this on because this is the resource we have to, to consume this as opposed to, we would definitely find another option should this game be simulcasted on a different network. Um, but I thought the broadcast was fine, good. I, I, I think um, that was was very much. I don't know. Some of it, some of Fox's stuff, still feels too inauthentic to me, um, and I think that is still where my grumbliness with it lies. Like they have this new commercial where they're like. Sh- like kind of like shoving it in ESPN's face that they're the number one most watched game on most weeks. And I think it's just kind of like, I don't know if college football fans care about that or they more so care about like the crazy, like the, the storytelling of college football. And I think that's what ESPN gets right in a lot of ways. I thought that was interesting. Um, game production in, in the stadium, the stadium experience, it was fine. I thought it was good. I didn't have too many complaints. Um, I, the stripe out I go back and forth with. I, it doesn't really bring any energy to the stadium. Um, now that we kind of looks good though, but it looks good. Like it, it's 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 very visually pleasing, and I think that's the main takeaway from it. Um, as somebody pointed out, though, now the students have to wear white for four straight games, which I thought was interesting. Um, so yeah, because uh, they don't have washing machines. Why is that a problem? Well, just like it's just like I don't know. Do you wish do you, do you, we've have we ever discussed that? Like, do you want Penn State fans to wear white every game, or do you just like let them let them wear what I they want? I thought about wear? that. I had, to, I think, I had, we talked about. I had this conversation with Guido when they first did it, and said, "Why not just make that your thing?" But it's kind of like teams. Fans won't bring it every game. Yeah, they just won't. Right? Like, you look at your team and say, "Why are they so flat?" Fans aren't going to bring it every game, so you might as well just make it for certain games. And let them think of it as something special. And I think that's kind of what the stripe out became. Like, I don't think Beaver Stadium, there was one point that it got pretty loud. I did buy a decibel reader and I forgot to bring it into the stadium with me, but also maybe that's a. Oh, I have one. I never thought about that. Um, I so, uh, but I, there was like one point the stadium pretty loud, but it was nowhere consistently as loud as it was for the Illinois game. It was very just kind of enjoying the football afternoon uh, with the family and friends type thing. But the team made it that way too, to yeah. their credit. Yeah. And I think that also helps too. Um, okay. This feels like the first, nah, and maybe this feels like the second real game of Penn State football season. And like, like the, 
like in some ways like the bowling green game became real in game um but it, this feels like the first one where i'm like i wouldn't say anxious but i'm not necessarily completely eager for for the way saturday shakes out in in 3 30 um i'm i'm interested to see how the travel thing works i'm interested to see how um penn state does with a more a much more passing attack this is the last the first time they played one really since the old miss game but like it wasn't necessarily the, the true team um so i'm interested there i, I don't know i'm i i think i think penn state can and probably should win i there's a small part of me that wonders do they win but i i think that as long as they kind of don't shoot themselves in the foot they at least have a a game plan and that's comes thanks to Minnesota and what they did this past weekend. You get, you get some insights from Minnesota. You hope you can defend the pass and you hope you don't get into your own head with the travel. I mean, that, that to me is the, the, the risk of the whole travel storyline. I think it's easy to say, yeah, we're going out Thursday. This is why we're doing this, but it's no big deal. They play the game at 3.30. We're going to kick off on this 3.30 noon or so. And that's not a message, as we've talked about messages that is consistent there that I, maybe I'm just over, Maybe I'm just not listening to it, but I, I don't feel it's ever a message that comes from the Penn State coach saying, it doesn't matter when they kick off, we're going to play, right? Like there, it's, it, that, there, there's always the process and there's this and we've done this and we've done this and I don't doubt they're prepared and I think that's great, but I think the go home line for all that stuff should be, but it really doesn't matter what time they played. We prepare, we step out there, we execute better, we'll be fine. I agree with that. Like it's, th- there's, there's too much... I think one of the biggest gripes I've had, and we talked about this, is like I feel like in G- bigger games, James Franklin tends to overthink things, and I think that might be like this kind of is a little bit of an example of that, like overthinking. Because I think it is, if you've ever traveled to the West Coast, you know it's very a lot easier to go from the East Coast to the West Coast than it is West Coast to East Coast. Um, you're just waking up a little bit earlier, and and I think that isn't necessarily like a concern to me it's going to be 3 30 penn state's body time and you can't really adjust that quickly um so i don't know i the i also just don't want the 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 travel thing to become an excuse either um but i and that's more so should they lose but i don't I just i you've had a two-ish years to prepare for it and figure this out and know this is coming so be ready Miami goes to Cal last week, struggles, wins the game, right? Cal's a very yeah. good team. I mean, I, I, it'll, it'll be interesting, and I'm sure somebody will do at the end of the season. Here's the Big Ten travel east to west and west to east and, and results of teams. But I would just feel more comfortable in the fan portion of my body if the message closed every time. With Yeah, we're doing that stuff. But honestly, we just got to go in the game. We got to go execute. It's about that. They kick off at the same time. We kick off. We play, the, we play on the same field. That's how we figured it out. I think that's... Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that's fair to to be yearning for that as a Penn State fan. Um, the the thing I did look up before the podcast tonight, I was I was curious about this. This is the first time Penn State has played in the Pacific Time Zone in a non bowl game since ninety one, and they've only played in in the Mountain Time once in that whole period, and that was against BYU. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I don't know. This is just the like things I find interesting podcast this week. I'm sorry. It's about where I'm at with it. No, that's the cool part about conference expansion, right? You get dog of non conference games, but you're gonna get some cool first time yeah. conference games against these opponents. No, it like Saturday was a neat experience. It was like, oh, this is cool to see a opponent that a lot of these people weren't alive for the last time they played, um, type deal. I I thought thought that was what made this past Saturday cool. And I think I'm interested to see how if if USC can kind of be the USC we think it can be, how they assimilate into the conference in that that fashion. Like, who's going to be their rival that isn't UCLA? Like, who's going to, like, is it going to be Ohio State? It's going to be Penn State? Is it going to be Michigan? Like, I, I think there's going to be a storyline there, and I think that's fun to to watch. And I think the same way with Oregon and even Washington as well. Um, although Washington and Michigan seem to have already figured out their their relationship pretty pretty well. well that's good makes it fun um all right anything else football wise nope what no. do you got next you got old guy young guy oh i do this is me i was asking about yeah. traffic and merging you yeah. said we old guy young guy so i'm curious and you said you had a story so 
and actually this I this started my part of the story started with my father. He came up last week and I forget where we were going and we were drive, driving somewhere together and there was a merge coming up. He's like, didn't you see that? Aren't you going to get over? I'm like, I got like a mile and a half. Like, what do you mean? He's like, but it said the lane's going to close. I'm like, I know, but they want you to go up there and take your turn and kind of get in and it'll flow easier. Well, if everybody would get in the lane at the same time, it'd be a lot easier. I'm like, well, I don't know. Is that really true? Like, I don't want to be backed up a whole mile and a half. So that was the discussion with us. Well, why are you I'm, making a face? I'm so glad you said this because this just like proves my point. And this is no offense to like anybody that is small town America. But like that is the most central PA small town America attitude about merges because living in the DMV now I have my driving ability has completely changed or stance on 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 merges has completely changed because I used to think everybody needs to line up like if it says there's a there's a merge two miles away four miles ago you better be in whatever lane you're supposed (laughs) to be in and so Saturday or I'm sorry yes Saturday after the game we drove back to Frederick if anybody in Altoona is listening, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But when you, on 99, when you come past the mall, um, like the, there is, a, it goes down to one lane. Yep. And we're driving and we get closer to like that, that exit there before, like, which is probably a, two miles or a mile and a half before. And there is traffic and, and nobody is in the right lane. No one's in the right lane. So I just get over in the right lane. <laughs> Uh-oh. And I'm driving down the road, driving around the road, and kind of you, you you kind of go into the mountains and the mountain curves around. You curve around the mountain. Well, we're now maybe three quarters of a mile away from the, the merge. Like the, the like the it's down to one. The lane. actual point. Yeah, yeah the yeah. actual point point of merge. And there is this guy in a work truck that is driving directly down the middle of both lanes because he's pissed off that people are going around him and getting up there and not merging properly. The proper way to merge that I have learned in the DMV area, Steve lived down this way too, he knows, is you you just stay in your lane until you can't stay in that lane no more. And that is, if you have to run, I watched a guy, I watched a guy coming up two weekends ago run over some cones up up in like right at the the maryland pa border because the guy wouldn't let him in if that happens like it, you have insurance on your car like it's <laughs> you'll be fine That's, so i'm glad I'm, I'm so glad you brought this topic this up. may be the segment of people stick around this long that generates the most response because it is it's it's so and in state college is tough because you know you know everybody right so like if you go to the merge point you're going to see somebody you know who's following following what they think the rules are right it happened today on college avenue they are doing construction between col between burroughs mm-hmm. and atherton okay and right at the light of atherton they're, they're getting you down to one lane so as soon as people cross the light across burroughs they're trying to get in that one lane if you do that and you don't use both lanes, then the lanes back all the way back up to college the rest of the way because people aren't taking up the space, right? Especially if they if they close it for like a whole section of the light right. and there's no place for people to move. And I was walking downtown to, to get my car and leave. And I'm like, and there's one guy sitting in the middle, like I'm making the turn and you can't, you just almost can't get around him. You don't want to, I don't know what injustice in the world you're fighting off. No one's trying to like take your first away from you or whatever else. I understand what the line says. I, and I told my father, I'm like, Dad, there's signs that say continue to merge point and take your turn. He's like, I've never seen one of those signs. And and to his point, places are inconsistent about it. I right? just like, think it, that's it's, like such a central PA, like like middle of nowhere. Because like <sighs> it's a state law in like five states. I looked it up. Like zipper merge is, is like a state law in like five states, but not in anywhere else. So this it's very is like, interesting. Uh, my mom's probably listening to this, and she's gonna be mad at me. For so, what did she do? Did she no, stay in line right away? She's so four miles back. It's 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 not even about the merging thing, but she'll be like, "We'll be in Altoona, and we'll get stuck at like two lights," and she'll be like, "God, the traffic's just terrible today." And I'm like, "Mom, I live in Maryland. I live in the DMV. I li- I, I drive on the Beltway with regularity." This is nothing. This is this is Mario Kart going 100 miles an hour compared to what the DMV and traffic can be. And it's just like that is such like a like Center County, Blair County, Huntington County thing that like if you name another county that we're going to get banned from. Keep it up. <laughs> you know, what would be interesting it would be if there's one lane of construction somewhere between State College and Harrisburg on Thursday to know what the buses do. 
when they're can taking the somebody, team to the airport. Can, uh, can somebody report that? <laughs> It'd be better if that were the case, and it would be someone would be pissed off at the buses, blocking the lane from two lane to one. That would, that would be perfect. They have a police escort. They're fine. They're oh, that's fine. true. That's true. They don't have to worry about it. I just, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought this up this week, because this was this is a very fresh topic near and dear to the heart. If people stick to the end, it'll be one of the sections we get the most response on, I'm sure. Okay. Um, let us know how to properly merge. <laughs> uh, see what else is going on this week on the blog. Um, there's uh, I put uh, 20% off some Zombie Nation stuff, if you'd like to buy that this week. I uh, say 20% there. Um, we'll have a game preview. Depth charts, something probably maybe from Steve. Uh, I'm writing about myths and made ups so okay. far this season. All right. Okay. Fine. Excited. Um, and then uh, game recap. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'm 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 watching the game from the couch on Saturday, so might might do like a hangout thing. Some I don't know. We'll see. I I have uh, concepts of, of a plan, as people are saying okay. these days. Um, so we'll do that. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. The blog, if you're looking for it, it's called stuffsummersays.com. On that website, there's a section called with Steve. Steve. Um, we have emails. Mine's Darian at stuffsummersays.com. Steve's is Steve at stuffsummersays.com. Uh, five stars, thumbs up. Appreciate Wogo coming on, hanging out with us as always. Thanks, Wogo. Um, yeah. About it. Other than this, that, which is our Twitter handles. Mine's at Stuff Summer Says. Steve's is. At Steve Sampson. See ya. Bye. See ya.